that my life would be different. And um, so I endeavored to make a personal change inside and to, you know, continue with that once I got out on the outside. Do I still have challenges like everyone else? Of course I do. Do I still falter? Of course I do. I've got personal challenges right now, but that is not going to turn me back to what I used to be because I look forward to what lies in the future. I think you uh, definitely <clears throat> changed for the better, that's for sure, so uh, awesome job with that. I'm not sure if you can hear me yet. Do you think that your faith brought you to Ron Paul, or what brought you to Ron Paul and his message? Faith did not bring me to Ron Paul. Um, I can say that unequivocally. What brought me to Ron Paul was the company I keep. <laughs> and um, where I was when I decided to uh, consider Ron Paul, I was at a place of not knowing where to go next. I had voted for George Bush twice. And in his last term, all those principles that I got caught up in and started to believe in, conservative principles, I was wondering if I was the only person who, who could see that that's not what the Republican Party stands for anymore. So uh, I was dumbfounded. I thought, what am I missing? I may as well be a member of the Democratic Party again. And um, so when Obama came on the scene, I listened to the hope and change, things that, that I wanted to hear a politician say. And I fell for it. And so I voted for Obama. And a year and a half later, I repented of that decision. And that's when I came to the awakening that both parties were of the same circus. They just traded clowns. And a buddy of mine, Michael Jam Smith, said, Derek, check out Ron Paul, because I expressed to him, I said, man, I don't know what to do next, because there is, there is no one. I said, check out Ron Paul, check out Ron Paul, check out Ron Paul, check out the Libertarian Party. I told him, I'm not interested in the Libertarian Party. Check out Ron Paul. I said, isn't he a part of the Republican Party? He said, still just check him out. You'll be pleasantly, pleasantly surprised. I don't want to spoil it for you, but you got to go read for yourself. So I started researching Ron Paul. And finding out why they called him Dr. No was the biggest eye-opener. Here's a man who for 30 years, 34 years, has stood strong on constitutional principles, never wavered. When I would preach, I would tell people, um, when they would ask me, well, you were down there, at, I saw you down there at Dudley's, and Dudley's is a bar. I say, I have the ability to walk into a room and not become like the room. So I can walk into Dudley's for whatever reason, whatever reason I choose, and the way I went in is the way I'm going to come out. I, if I go in alone, I'm going to come out alone, not with some woman hang on, hanging off my shoulder like a cheap suit. So uh, that is, to me, the hallmark of an individual, one who does not change because of the surroundings, uh, in other words, becoming worse than what he was before he was, you know, surrounded by uh, others that may seek to have him do wrong. So that impressed me about Ron Paul. And then I investigated the charges of racism. Even if Ron Paul did write those letters, the things that I read, from my point of view, they were not racist. See, I'm one of the few black people who call a spade a spade, pun intended. Um, I don't worry about the KKK or a white man home invading me or carjacking me. Uh, the chances of that happening to me is going to be more than likely at the hands of a, another Negro. So, you know, I keep things in proper perspective. And being that I recognize that, 
it's my duty to speak the truth about it. And the things that I read or the comments in those letters by the guy who actually wrote them, you know, he was talking about how to how to protect yourself in an urban environment. Well, hell, if you live in an urban city, you need to know how to watch your back because if you don't, you might find yourself a victim. So that being said, and I'm not saying that Ron Paul wrote the letters, there was nothing really racist about the letters, but because of our political correctness, we have allowed the media to take anything that anybody might say that might be disparaging towards one group, because you know we all call up in the group dynamic, and, and use it to start labeling people as racist. And what surprises me about white America is that they are so afraid of being called a racist that they cave in and will not speak the truth. And that irritates the hell out of me because, Matt, white folks are the ones that are going to have, have to make the difference in this country because I'm going to tell you, the Negroes don't have the numbers to make the difference. Now, I know people talk about where there are some areas where blacks make a difference, but that's mostly at a local level. But on the national level, this is something that, for the most part, white folks are going to have to turn around. People like me, blacks like myself, all we do is simply sweeten the pot or, you know, add a little more fortitude to it or, you know, a little backup. But blacks don't have 13% of the total population of the U.S. Man, we ain't going to change nothing. White folks are going to have to wake up and, and smell the coffee on this. But I know I got off point. But um, so a after going through all of that research and Ron Paul realizing that this is a man who has not allowed himself to be compromised by party politics, a man who has the experience and the insight to realize, well, okay, well, I tried it in the libertarian movement, but because our system is so corrupt, I know the only way that I would have an opportunity this time around, I needed to get into the Republican Party. See, seeing all of these things just helped me to see the brilliance of this man. And I said, this this is the man that I want to pattern my political ideology after because if I can stand on my principles no matter what, then I will be saying more than anyone. And the thing that people miss that Ron Paul has accomplished because many folk are quick to say he has accomplished nothing, Ron Paul has shown us that it is possible to go to D.C and not be compromised. And that's that's so very true. I mean, when you look at Congress's approval rating down by 11%, uh, look at what they're voting on. The majority of the time, we get mad at them because they're voting for things. Look at the person who opposed almost every single one of those bills. Why don't we try to vote more people in that said no? Because maybe saying no is better than saying yes. You know, it's almost like how a parent can spoil a child and you get that child dependent on you saying yes all the time and then you just keep going, keep going, keep going, it gets worse and worse and worse. I think that's what the Congress and the federal government did to Americans. They said yes so many times, they just started doing it just because it would get them reelected. Even if it wasn't for the betterment of the country, they did it just to advance them politically. When in the end, if you think about it, in honest media, with actual true reporting, they should be the ones reporting on all the yesers instead of the naysayers and all the, the doctor knows. We need more doctor knows in Congress. I, um, I totally agree. I see somebody had asked a question here in the chat room. You don't think African Americans help Obama win the presidency? Uh, no, because African Americans can't vote in America. I don't even know what the hell an African American is. Uh, that's a misnomer. Uh, I'm not from Africa. I haven't lost a damn thing in Africa. I was born in America. I am a black man who happens to be American. Rather, I am an American who happens to be a black man. Now, did blacks help Obama to get in office? Of course. Millions of black folks gave uh, uh, hundreds, or shall I say millions of dollars to his campaign. But the fact of the matter is, it was dollars that helped to put that message out there. But when it came down to the numbers uh, at the polls, 
that's not really what did it by and large. Most folks don't understand the electoral college and, and, and how it works. If every person in America, black person that is, voted for Obama, and every white person in America voted against Obama, Obama would not have won. And it's that little, little simple point that I can't get folks to understand. It was a plus the black folks and other minorities that helped Obama to win, but more so in large part by white America. And that is how Obama got into the White House. Now, getting further into it, blacks only voted for Obama for the most part, and I'll guess to say 95% only voted for the man because he is black. When I voted for Obama, it was because I was thoroughly disgusted with the Republican Party. George Bush's bailing out of uh, Wall Street, his bailing out of General Motors, all of those things are anti-capitalistic policies, anti-constitution, anti-American. Uh, uh, if you ask me, you get out there and you make a business and you decide to, 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 to go for it and you make bad decisions, you fail. Somebody else picks up the slack. Somebody else would have picked up the slack if GM had failed because GM was filling a niche, okay? So if, if, if we have a need for 100 cars a year and GM provided 30 of them, okay, well, if GM failed, guess what? Those 30 cars, that demand, somebody else would have simply filled the demand. And why we have forgotten those base, basic principles of capitalism is beyond me, but that is all a part of where the Republicans and the Democrats are. They feel they have to think for us. And until Americans can come to the realization that neither party has what's in the best interest of America, they will forever falter. But you know what? I'll be able to sleep at night because I will know I will have voted for a principled man and not party line politics. So no, uh, black folks, for the most part, you may as well have stayed home if you didn't vote for Obama based on principles. When I voted for Obama, again, it was based on principles because I wanted to see real change. When that man started talking about transparency, no more backdoor deals, man, I bought that because that's what I wanted to hear. But I had, I, I had been ignoring Ron Paul for the last 34 years. Had I heard Ron Paul saying those things, Matt, I don't for the life of me know where the hell I've been for the last 30 years. Okay, cause. I feel the same way, man. I, uh, I almost fell on the same train and voted Obama. I mean, I donated to Obama's campaign. That was the first time I became politically active just because uh, my grandparents actually kind of got me into politics. My grandpa was just a staunch neocon, loved Bush, loved all those people. Then my grandma is just as liberal as it can come. So I would always learn from them. And I kind of sided uh, that my grandpa lost the majority of the arguments with my grandma, so I thought my grandma had to be more correct than him. So I kind of listened a little bit more, and I started forming my own opinions. But then when Obama came in, he said so many things that we actually needed, like all those things that you're talking about, transparency, ending the wars in Iraq come day one, uh, shutting down Gitmo, all these great things that if he actually would have accomplished the things he campaigned on, he would have been one of the better presidents we've had in the past 25 years. So Obama's campaign did a great job selling him. Unfortunately, the product that we purchased is not what we ordered. So it's kind of, we got screwed out of a deal. But that's in the past. Timot, I want to talk to you about ground wars and how we can get involved in it and what other people can do to help just grow Ground Wars as a group. Okay. Ground Wars, the ultimate goal for it is to make moot party line politics. What are party line politics? Party line politics are the things that my mother uh, still is engaged in, my father used to be engaged in, that's where if it's not a Democrat, I'm not voting for them. They only show up if it's to vote for a Democrat. 
It doesn't matter whose name is on the ballot. That's what you vote for. I learned of that early on. You vote party line, period, because these are the ones that have your best interest at heart. It was a, wake, a, a rude awakening for me to find out that white people were the same way. Uh, and, and when I realized that white people were the same way, I was shocked because as I started moving, as I moved more into uh, uh, getting involved in politics and I started seeing what was happening, I realized that the Tea Party movement, many of those folks within the Tea Party movement, and, and, and some say it's because they were co-opted. But when I had a falling out with the Facebook Tea Party, it was because I was not walking in lockstep with their ideology. Their ideology, not the ideology of constitutional principles. Because anybody who stands behind Mitt Romney, you can't be a constitutionalist. It, it just does not mix. And so I don't know if the people are just damn stupid or if they just can't comprehend what constitutional principles are all about. So the goal of Ground Wars is, is one, to make moot party line politics. Well, how do you do that? You start looking for individuals at the local level that stand on constitutional principles and we support them. The only difference is if somebody is running, let's say, for the 4th District here in Georgia like Greg uh, Palin or the 5th District uh, like uh, Charles Gregory, we promote him nationally and get people to contribute to his campaign nationally. If we have 100 people from all 50 states to contribute 10 bucks to his campaign on a local level, that makes a big dent. When we start putting in individuals at the local level into office, and I mean school board chairmen, uh, our senators, our congressmen, people we send to Washington, when we start building this base of, of constitutional-minded uh, uh, individuals, when they do go to Washington, guess what? People like a Ron Paul will have somebody to work with, and then we ignore uh, we ignore the party. See, somebody, two things. One person told me, well, wait a minute. You're interviewing this guy, Kurt Haskell. He's a Democrat. See, that's already an idiot that's caught up in party line politics, okay? Because the man is an idiot. The man said, I support constitutional principles. Well, I wanted to hear what he had to say. This is how you know where a person is coming from. See, we're so used to letting the press the, the press, mainstream media, that our candidates for us, we don't take time to find out for ourselves. But I want to ask him. I want to get it on the record, get it recorded, so when he goes to Washington and does something contrary to what he said he would do, I can then stand up and say, you, sir, are a liar. Okay? Here are your words. You want me to play it back for you? All right? That's what we need to be able to do. Uh, we need to vet individuals ourselves. So we need to start doing this at the local level. Because if Ron Paul went to Washington right now, Ron Paul is going to meet gridlock. The only power Ron Paul will have will be that of the veto. We would still have to start replacing the bastards in both the Republican and the Democratic Party. So Ground Wars is about giving a platform starting at the local level, the grassroots level first. Okay, because I believe in a bottom-up method of building. You build your foundation, and then as you build your foundation, you can stack precept upon precept upon precept, and nobody can come along and blow you down. See, anything built on a lie can't stand, but when you build on truth, that is what you get. So that is the purpose of Ground Wars and how people can get involved. You need to start telling the people that are running in your area, your districts, your counties, your states, they need to interview on ground wars so that ground wars can get behind them not only in putting the word out there so that people can come and find out what it really is you are about, but so that we can support you financially because it takes money to run a campaign. And, and ground wars is committed uh, 
This is, we're not in this to make money for ourselves. We're in this to put money into the campaigns of individuals that would serve. I didn't say people that would be great. I said people that would serve because Jesus Christ said, he among you that would be great, let them first, you know what I'm saying? Let them first serve. And our congressmen have forgot about, they have forgotten we the people. When they go to Washington these days, they go to rule, not to serve. That's so true. That's kind of why we only have one statesman, and that's what Ron Paul is. He's a statesman and not a congressman. He goes there and he represents the people. Uh, basically, I've had the same philosophy as you for a long time. We need to start by gutting out government and doing that at local levels and working our way all the way up. Uh, my philosophy is if we put the right individuals in the government, eventually they'll work themselves out of a job. Because with how big and oversized uh, our government is right now, they need to shrink. We need to condense. We need to cut people, lay them off. They need to do this, though, on their own. Because that means they've regulated so much, uh, hopefully they lose all their powers, and it goes back to the people. If the people have the power, that's when the government fears us. But when the people fear the government, there's tyranny. And that's what I believe we're really starting to slip into. So until we start giving the power back to the people, there's nothing we can do. We can elect Ron Paul to be president, and that's a great move in the right direction. But Ron Paul will not get anything through. Ron Paul will not get anything done unless he does some executive orders, which we always complain about Obama and Bush and all these other presidents doing. And we kind of want to hold Ron Paul to be above the other presidents. You know, Ron Paul is a man of principle and we don't want him to lose his integrity just by going and doing all these unconstitutional things. So so why vote for him? Uh, because we need him. Uh, if you're not taking the first step, why even get out of bed? You know, it's, it's just, there's no point. So for somebody to ask you why vote Ron Paul, because if you don't vote, you're willingly leading yourself to the slaughterhouse. If you're not trying to push the brakes on a car on the ice, I know sometimes it won't stop, but at least you can say you tried. If you're not willing to try, go home and watch Fox News. Don't listen to me anymore. I don't want to waste your time. I'm not willing to give up and not hit the brakes and just walk to the slaughterhouse. I'm going to vote Ron Paul no matter what. Ron Paul or Ron Paul is my man. I don't care if it's Gary Johnson. I don't care if it's Robbie Wells guy. Sure, these guys might be good down the road, but right now, Ron Paul is our main man that we need to get behind back in the whole way to Tampa and even after Tampa, and we write him in come November. Plain and simple, it's Ron Paul or Ron Paul. So I know I got sidetracked a little bit, but why would we, why would we fight so long to just all of a sudden give up just because it got hard. It's been hard for 34 years, as Timont said. Ron Paul's been ignored by so many of us, and I'm guilty of that. I mean, I, I liked Obama. I didn't, Ron Paul has been in since 1988 was his first run, I believe, as a libertarian. Then back in 2008 was his second run as a Republican. And now in 2012, he's having his third and final run. We have to stop ignoring Ron Paul use him because Ron Paul is just a person. I don't give a crap what Ron Paul is as a person if it's his message that I love and I would vote for anyone that had his message. What Ron Paul brings to the table that many other people don't that have the same message is his track record. Ron Paul's history is what gives me comfort at night when I go to sleep knowing that I'm not wasting my vote. I'm giving it to a person who will go to Washington be a rock in Washington, not be moved and swayed by all the lobbyists, all the special interest people. Ron Paul can go there and represent the people. You're absolutely right. Um, you made a couple of great points, and, and, and I want to just highlight one of them, if I may. You said, what's the point in getting out of bed if you're going to work this hard just to quit? I don't know what it is in human nature, but we as people, when we tend to think that things are not going to go the way that we want it, we want to lay down and quit. And what I try to remind people of all the time, nothing, nothing is ever as good as we want it to be. And I know some folk are going to say, well, yes it is, you know, uh, you know, I went and got this and said, 
trust me, anything in life, you can always find something that might add something to it. In other words, everything that you have, well, if, if my wife uh, weighed 10 pounds less, you know, I'd be, you, you, you get where I'm coming from. So my point is we can always come up with something to make it better than what it was. Well, with that being said, Ron Paul might not make it to the White House, but that does not mean we quit. I still look at what Ron Paul has brought me to today. Now, there's still going to be somebody like, why are you saying Ron Paul won't win? I didn't say Ron Paul won't win. I said if Ron Paul doesn't win, I still consider what Ron Paul has still given me, and that is an awakening. Ron Paul has given me the fortitude. He has strengthened my resolve. He has, has, has become a beacon of light that allows me to say, this man didn't quit for 30 years. I will not quit for the remaining years that I have. And that is what I flow through. Even if Ron Paul does not get to Washington, I will continue to fight to get other people in because Ron Paul, if Ron Paul were the end all and be all, this would be over with if Ron Paul didn't win. Thank God Ron Paul is only a man. Thank God he's only a man. All men are created equal. That means there are other men out there that are like Ron Paul. If I may quote Jesus Christ, he said, you shall do greater things than I have. And he raised the dead. So there are other folk out there that we need to be getting behind that will go and do the things that Ron Paul has set in motion. And the other point that you made, Matt, about how we do with our children, we can spoil them. Uh, we need to say no sometimes. You are exactly right. What we have done to America by not saying no, and trust me, there was, there was an agenda behind it. By not saying no was to get people hooked on the teat. Okay? That was, on, that was by design. Because once you hook people on the teat, always bringing it to them, what motivation is there for them to get up to go in and, and produce their own milk? as long as somebody is going to continue to bring it to them. So you, you made a couple of good points, and I just wanted to, you know, expound on them a little bit. Well, we got like five minutes left. Uh, I know I had somebody ask a question earlier. They want to know if you have room in your car uh, coming down to Paul Fest. I can't remember who it was, but they said they'd love to record a video with you in the car on your way down. Who was that? I have room. I have a seven-passenger uh, Nissan uh, Pathfinder. So yeah, I've got I've got room at this point uh, in my vehicle. Just my wife and I are going. So uh, somebody wants to tag along, you're more than welcome to go with me. Tima, what's the best uh, way for people to reach you? Facebook or on YouTube? Let's uh, let's get your link up there. Um, www.tima.net takes you to everything I've got, my Twitter, my Facebook, my fans of TMOT page, and my YouTube account. So if anybody want to find out anything about me, they can go there. There's also a contact page. If you want to send me some information, uh, just click on contact me, fill out the, you know, the information. And, you know, I always respond uh, to my emails. Uh, I don't always respond to comments on YouTube because I just get too many, but uh, people that reach out to me on Facebook and, uh, uh, you know, on my uh, fans of TMOT page or on my email, my, my website, I get back to them and, you know, because, they, you know, it's all about building relationships. I don't, so don't, don't send me nothing and say, hey, TMOT, send me a friend request. I ain't going to do it, okay? Also, just an FYI for everyone. Tmot and their band is playing at Paul Fest on the 25th. Then he's playing at the Ron Paul Rally on the 26th. Uh, on the 24th, he's playing at Ron Paul Stock in Georgia. And on July 21st, he's playing at the protest against war in Charlotte, North Carolina. 
So if you're in the area around there, be sure, well, of course, the majority of you guys here are going to be down at Paul Fest and going to the Ron Paul rally. So we're going to see Team Out play at least twice, which is pretty cool. I see that you're a bass player, if I'm correct. Yes, I play bass and the lead vocals. And, uh, you know, we, we do mostly Jimi Hendrix, but what we've been doing to celebrate Ron Paul, I've been rearranging the or, or re rewriting the words to some songs uh, to uh, exemplify what Ron Paul has been about. Like, I Won't Back Down, Tom Petty, uh, when we do All Along the Watchtower, All Along the Watchtower, by, originally written by Bob Dylan, but Hendrix's version, Outside in the Cold Distance, Ron Paul uh, did growl. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that we do, and we, we really have fun doing it. Well, Timot, Minister Dare, Grayson, I appreciate you coming on my first show. I think you definitely gave it the boost and the zest that everyone needed uh, for sure. So I thank you, and I look forward to having you on here whenever you have time. Matt, any time. Matt, I would, on our Ground War show, uh, we've, all, we've got one slated, but in the month of August, I would like for you to co-host with me. Count me in, man. Count me in. That sounds awesome. I mean, we got the same philosophy, so it's like our minds are connected. We think the same. So awesome. Thank you for coming on tonight, and uh, look forward to seeing your videos tomorrow. I'm sure I'll see two or three new ones. <laughs> you most certainly will. You take it easy, and the rest of you guys, enjoy you. Love you. Hey, listen, I said I won't send a friend request, but if you send me one, I'll accept. t -Mod out, folks. Bye, t -Mod. All right, and now our second guy, Mr. Kerry Korn. Let me give out a link really quick. Kerry, how's it going? Hey, it's going great. Uh, hopefully uh, all the sound is good and the tinfoil hat's not getting in the way of our broadcast. Sound good to me, man. Hey, you know what? what you know, while you're while you're doing that, I gotta tell you, it's it's really awesome to, to be on the show. I've been following your stuff on YouTube for a while and you know to follow you and, and Tmot, man, I got my work cut out for me, brother. Oh, I think that you like to just make me blush, but uh, anyways, I want to talk about your show. Uh, this is something new. I haven't heard it very much. I've heard a couple shows that I looked up today. And uh, tell me about your show. What got you into radio and politics, basically? What got you so uh, active, basically, about this stuff? Well, you know, it, it actually kind of started out as a joke. I, I have a friend of mine who lives back in Denver, and, and his name's Justin. He's of a unique political philosophy. He's what they call an anarcho-communist. And we cracked a joke one day that, you know, we should start a TV show called The Commie and the Conspiracy Theorist. You know, next after Perfect Strangers, The Commie and the Conspiracy Theorist, must see TV, right? And uh, we stumbled upon Blog Talk Radio and, you know, kind of, you know, that whole, should we go ahead and do it anyway? All right, well, let's do it anyway. And that's really what started the, the radio show stuff. And the, the early shows are really hard to listen to. Yeah, I can't even begin to tell you how bad they are. It really sounds like two guys just griping over a telephone at one another about what they saw on TV, that sort of thing. Bad. But, you know, you, you kind of build a, a repertoire. You kind of you kind of get a, a persona. And we adopted the names, really, that had been used to discriminate or, or besmirge our, our political philosophies. I've been called a, a conspiracy theorist, black helicopter guy, tinfoil hat, so I adopted it. It's on the head, you know. Once it's there, go ahead and call me that, and then let's get to the message, you know. Let's, let's, let's talk the information. And that seems to put a stop to a lot of, a lot of name calling in a hurry. So what really woke you up, I guess, to Ron Paul? Uh, basically just because he's not the only, he's basically the only outsider. <laughs> he doesn't do all his insider trading. Or what made you find Ron Paul, basically? Well, you know, I'd already been kind of a fan of Ron Paul. I'd heard him do some interviews. Uh, you know, everybody is is aware of the fact that he's done a lot of the Alex Jones show, and I stumbled across him there originally. Um, but for me, really, the big the big point of I really like this guy is when he did the speech neocon from the House floor. Do you, do you remember? Oh, 
wow. You know, I saw that and it was done. It was done. And you start researching the guy, you see he's got that that sterling record. You can't it's it's just a beautiful thing to look at. Somebody who says, This is what I'm going to do and then he goes to Washington and he does it. You, you can't uh, find me someone else who's doing that. Maybe Congressman Amash. I you know, maybe. The jury's still out on him, I think. I'll 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 hold my <laughs> hold my judgment. He's still pretty young. I mean, he doesn't have that record that Ron Paul does, but uh, definitely somebody we need to keep our eye on. Uh, when was your last show? Was it on Sunday or was it this? Uh, yeah, this this last Sunday, and pretty much it was just me talking about the little vacation I went on. Uh, the girlfriend and I and her kids, we just kind of piled in the van and went east, uh, Virginia, Philadelphia, or not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I always do that, and I'm going to get beat for it later, I'm sure, but. Uh, just a little bit of the, the eastern eastern states and in uh, you know, a little history lesson. Went to the Flight 93 Memorial, went to the Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, you know, a couple presidents, Jefferson Davis buried there, lots of Confederate stuff. Very, very interesting. Just kind of drive around and see how rural America has been destroyed. Right. So what is your take on Tampa? What do you think is going to come out of Tampa? Uh, whether it's just Paul Fest or if you actually want to touch on what do you think is going to happen down at the RNC? You know what, I, I really hope that the two, uh, you know, are related to one another. And I'll tell you what, what I'm thinking, you know, you go down and do Paul Fest. And from the moment it was conceived, I've been promoting it. I've had the, the lady, Susan Wolf on, who's the, the coordinator for the travel and all of that. You know, I've had her on. I'm actually... I, w I don't want to say we're like best friends, but you know we've we've known each other for a number of years, and so I got right on helping them promote that from Jump Street. And what I you know, what I really hope happens here is we're looking at 35, 40, 50 thousand Ron Paul supporters in Tampa on the eve of the Republican National Convention, and they they show up, show up. You know we we, we faced so much of a media blackout. And if not a blackout, they, they went about their ways to try to marginalize and, and demean the movement. Make them cover it. Make them cover it. I really feel like with all the delegates we've won, the Republican National Convention is going to be must-see TV. It's going to be it's, it's going to be brutal. I think I think it's going to be so hard for the media to ignore Paul Fest. I mean. Where can you get another candidate out there? What candidate right now can get people to drive or fly or take a van across America? Ron Voys, man. Exactly. Ron Voys, all these different systems. I mean, people are going to be taking buses. I'm flying down there. I mean, I'm going from Minnesota. It's, it's not very close. I mean, I'm traveling across America, so I have the chance to go see Ron Paul and listen and be surrounded with some of the most awesome liberty-minded people out there right now and sure it'll be awesome hearing the music but I think I'm more excited for the speakers I mean Peter right. Sheep, Lou, Lou Rockwell uh, uh, who else I know that there's a couple other pretty big names out there that are going to be speaking and I think just being in that kind of energy I think that it'll make so many people feel better the the energy of kind of coming back into you. It'd almost be like spending a weekend at a spa. I honestly think that once you leave on the 26th or 27th, you're going to feel alive. You're going to feel like a new person because that's what America should feel like. That's what all of Americans should be like. Liberty-minded, not just these zombie sheeple that just walk like they're zombies, you know, people without emotions. The people that are going to be down at Paul Fest are going to be real, alive, awake people that actually have emotions, they have Second Amendments, they have Fourth Amendments, they have First Amendments, they have all these different amendments that they actually practice and try to hold true and like keep dear to them because these are all things that I believe people that watch mainstream media news are taking for granted on a daily basis. And the people that are going to be down there, I heard that there's a campgrounds where there's actually a shooting ground at. And people are going to be down there. They're going to be packing heat. They're going to be practicing their Second Amendment while they're down there. Camp Liberty, exactly. That it's going to be awesome. So I think all these people that are going to be down there, 
we understand it's seventy-seven dollars, but if we don't go and support these people that will be at Paul Fest, that's seventy-seven dollars in about a year or two at be worth nothing. You can't even buy a loaf of bread with a wheelbarrow full of this fake toilet paper fiat money. So unless we spend our money now and try to invest it in people, not in items, because buying items does not work. Uh, when I say investing in people, I'm not saying purchasing people. I'm saying investing in people and having them actually have the chance that good people make it into Washington and your local government and your districts and stuff like that and then represent the people. If we don't spend our money now, it's going to be worthless very, very, very soon. So it's it's just a catch-22, basically. And, and you're absolutely right. You know, this is this is one of those things. I mean, you talked about it, seventy-seven dollars. Well, what's that going to what's that going to be worth in in ten years? How much do you have to spend to get the same? Let's just look at it like you were getting the wickedest rock concert you can possibly imagine. All of these great bands. There's going to be speakers, stand-up. Con I mean, you're talking about this is this is Woodstock for the truth. This is this is Woodstock for the truth. And, you know, this is one of those situations where you're going to be able to look at family members and go, yes, I made it to Paul Fest. It was amazing. And I look at it like that. You know, I'm trying to figure out how to fund it myself because, you know, we really spent a lot of money doing the, the trip we just did. But I, Lord Wind on the Creek don't rise, it's on. You know, I, I can't help but, but want to be a part of this. And, I, you know, I... I, I don't know if I had any effect at all, but when I found out they were doing it and booking talent, I sent the talent booker for Paul Fest <laughs> the Access Experiences information. I, I mean, you know, why not? Like, I, I don't. You, know, Jam Smith is in the chat room, and he's T Mott's guitars for that band. The man's guitar playing abilities is outstanding. The man shreds. He sets fire, fire to the guitar. I want to address someone. There's a Liz in the room, and she asked me why I didn't vote for Ron Paul in 2008. I've said this many, many times. I did not vote for Ron Paul, and I did not vote for Obama. I actually did not vote for a president back in 2008. Uh, I voted for every other person, but I did not actually vote for a president in 2008. Okay. What year then are you at? 2012. Oh, why I didn't vote for Ron Paul? I was in Germany. <laughs> Pretty hard to vote when you're in Germany. Uh, I live in Minnesota, and I was actually in Germany. I just got back uh, less than two months ago, so I missed my chance to vote for Ron Paul. I missed my chance to become a delegate. That is why I'm doing everything I can now, because I never got to make... <laughs> thanks for forgiving me. I never got to make my mark on Minnesota. I wanted to be part of that history making 32 out of 40 delegates for Ron Paul out of Minnesota. I would have driven anywhere. I would have done anything it would have taken to become a delegate for Ron Paul and represent uh, Minnesota down in Tampa. So that's that, uh, I guess. I had, the, I had the same thing in 2008 when it came time to, to vote for a president I was in. In Denver, I had just moved out there when when the general election started, and they would not let me ride in Ron Paul. So Ron Paul endorsed Chuck Baldwin. I voted for Chuck Baldwin. I went with the constitutionalist candidate there, and of course you hear that, oh, you threw your vote away. No, I voted my conscience, and you know here's a man who is saying and and showing. You, you go read Chuck Baldwin stuff. I mean, he says the exact same things that that we tend to talk about. You know protect the Second Amendment, protect the Constitution, end all these foreign wars. So, you know, that the choice there was really easy for me. So what do you see, I guess, happening in the next six months? Say Ron Paul is elected tomorrow's president. What will happen within the first six months of him being elected? Day one, you see him be able to make his biggest mark by rescinding these executive orders. Yeah, this has been the president's end around Congress. It, this is a, a gross misuse of power, and you know, with the swipe of a pen, he is going to be able to roll back so much stuff. Although he might keep JFK's uh, what is it, Executive Order one 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 zero something like that. Anyway, it was the you know it it, it authorized the uh, the Treasury to start 
putting out silverback dollars and start at the end of the, the Federal Reserve. You might see him keep that one around, but you know, I think you'll see a huge rollback of executive orders, and, and that that's a good start. And it leads by example. Do you think that we'd see a bigger push to end the Fed uh, if we had a president that would be pro ending the Fed, or do you think that uh, the people that actually have to put out the legislation are going to change and just try to fight against Ron Paul just because they want to try to make him a lame duck president to where he can get nothing done? Well, and, and, and in a minute I'll address this in, in my conspiratorial fashion. But let, you know, let's look at it like this, okay? You know, you have the exact same philosophy that you can now apply to these people that are telling you to go vote for Mitt Romney. We've got to support. We've got to support our candidate. We've got to support our president. You got to do the right thing. You know, he's. Are you Are you really going to do that to your own party? Come on now, guys. You know, just turn the condescending. The the the, the just turn the flow on. Just turn it all on. Let them have it. But you know, uh, there's something that worries me, and, and I'd like your you to kind of espouse on this too. If Ron Paul were to get into office, we know how micromanaged, manipulated this economy is. It's become, you know, very much crony capitalism. You know, when you can see the banks threatening Congress with martial law, if you don't pass the banker bailout, there's a problem with who's got authority and power in this country. And it, it tinfoil hat, see right there. I, I don't put it past them to, you know, if we got a Ron Paul president to just flush this economy and then go see what happens, libertarian philosophy, free market, now it's all ruined, this is your fault. Does, so you, do, you see, do you think that would go down? So you really think that they would just kind of pull the rug out from under our feet with the economy and other things like that if Ron Paul did so they can be like, hey, look at what happens when we actually get this kind of president in. Uh, but to go back, actually, to your other point, you're talking about how the Republicans always say just toe the party line, just support right. your president because he's a Republican. Do you think they're going to sing that same song if Ron Paul was in there? Is it, we got to support Ron Paul because he's a Republican? I mean, it's just... Well, see, I don't know if they would. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut, cut you off. I, I don't know if they would initially, but that's... That's the tool we then get double-edged sword. You know, now we get to turn those blades on them. You know, oh, oh Ron Paul's horrible. We can't do. You gotta toe the party line. He's your president. Are you really gonna do that to your party? Are you gonna? Do I don't think you want to be responsible for that. Do you really want four more years of Obama? Do you really? Do you real? Ron Paul, guys, come on now. Yeah, I mean. We like to try to stay above uh, their rhetoric, but yet at the same point, I think I would be in such a great mood after getting Ron Paul elected, I think I would break down for a day or two and probably uh, stoop to their level and be like, hey, come on, toe the party line, you remember? I mean, we did this for you. We, we elected Bush two times in a row. I mean, now it's your turn to uh, pat our back, I guess. So... Basically, right now, we have about eight minutes left. I kind of want to open up the room for questions if you guys want. Uh, Yoan, you there? Uh, if you want, somebody could hop up, do video question if they want. Uh, but if anybody has any questions. Yeah, I'm open for anything. Uh, you know, I've got to, I, 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 as long as I know what I'm talking about, I'm not afraid to mention if I'm speculating or if I'm actually wrong about something. So. Swing, bring it on. It'll be great. Hey, Charles, what's your question? Hello? Hello, Charles? Charles. Who do I think is going to be Ron Paul's VP? Uh, I would have loved to see Judge Andrew Napolitano, pure and simple Napolitano. Uh, everyone says he'd be a better Secretary of State or whatever it is, but I want Napolitano as VP because if anything would happen to Ron Paul, heaven forbid, I got plenty of trust in Napolitano. So good to go for nap for number two. See, and I, I tend to like Jesse Ventura as well. 
you know, because if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna do something, dirt, or, you know, Ron Paul, heaven forbid, has a health problem, they are not gonna mess with with either one of those guys. They are not gonna mess with the judge. They are not gonna mess with the governor. It's just the way it is. Although, you know, I wouldn't mind seeing, you know, Judge Napolitano as Attorney General either, or on the Supreme Court. They put a constitutionalist on the Supreme Court. Oh, nice, nice. Some. Anyone else in the green room have another question? What's up, Mac? Anybody? Sorry, what, what do you mean by uh, speaker? Uh, yes, I do think Rand Paul will because he made his uh, pledge to support the nominee. So if Ron Paul's the nominee, of course he will be. Uh, does Ron Paul have a five-state plurality? No, he has an 11-state plurality. We don't need five, we have 11. So we do not have a five-state plurality. That is incorrect. And you know they're trying to make... They're trying to make a lot of noise about how it all hinges on Nebraska. You heard that in the mainstream media. He's only got four states. Reach him out. All that. Look how many. Look how many states where he walked away with all the delegates. Give me a break, man. I, mean, I really wish the media. You know, it's it. You and I are the media now, Matt. You you do understand that we are the media. The mainstream media is nothing more than than disseminators of propaganda in the state line, and that's it. Yeah, for sure. What about Dennis Kucinich for VP? I think strategy-wise that would be good, uh, but I don't agree with Kucinich on everything also. So, uh, but uh, yes, bound. Yes, they are bound uh, per se, but that's not according to all the rules. You know, these federal laws that we don't like abiding by most of the time, uh, they're kind of unbound, and there's many things that state that too. So. We are going to fight it, and I saw someone, uh, are they able to nominate Dr. Paul now? I guess I'm confused by the question, but anyway, I saw someone asking about, uh, how powerful is this movement? Uh, this movement is as powerful as we make it, because it's us that's the movement. It's not something that we have to go out and buy, uh, so it's basically is how active do you want to be? That's how powerful we're going to be. And and you got to look at it from from a point of view of, of of it's each individual's effort applied to the the whole movement. This is not you know oh we're a group. You know we're not looking for special favors. I I, I talk about a lot of times we're we're, we're fighting the kraken. Yeah, this this system has its tentacles everywhere. And so everybody's got little little pet issues that they want to focus on. Some people are anti Monsanto. Some people are, you know, all about protecting their Second Amendment rights. So what what I do is I try to network these people together. You know, you may not think Monsanto's that dangerous, but support these people when they go out to do activism against Monsanto, and they are more likely to return the favor when you go out to protest some sort of you know uh, gun control law. That's true. Uh, as for people saying, can we nominate Ron Paul now? No, because technically no one has won a state yet. Until Tampa, these delegates haven't voted yet, so we can't say anyone's won states. Now we might have them the majority of delegates, but you know, people are people. They can change their minds. So until we actually get down to Tampa, and it's the 27th through the 30th, it's a three-day convention, we don't know who won what yet, technically, because the people haven't voted. So we have to wait, we have to be patient, but we have to be supportive, too, of all the delegates. This is the most important time right now to be supportive, because if they're going down there and they're elected, they might not want to go down there, because it's expensive. <laughs> not everyone lives in Florida. Many people are represented. There are 50 states representative, plus... Uh, I don't know if the territories like Guam and stuff like that send their delegates there. They probably do. But 
can you imagine the immense expenses that all these delegates are taking on to just represent us, to give us a chance? So I saw a question earlier, when do we go balls to the wall? If you're not going balls to the wall, you're just spinning your wheels. You need to go full speed. Don't just go in first gear. Go as fast as you can, as hard as you can, waking up as many people as you can to the movement because you don't know when it could be your last chance to wake someone up. So I say you go balls to the wall 100% of the time. Let me add something to the delegate issue that you mentioned. I know for a fact that the Paul Fest people have set up some sort of a program where you can donate money to send delegates from your state to the RNC. So you might look into that. Just uh, I, I believe this, the site is paulfestival.org. Go in there and just talk to them folks. They'll be able to point you in the right direction. And FYI, this is water, uh, no beer. So, uh, well, Kerry, it was awesome having you on. I see we reached our 9 p.m. Uh, so I think the show's got to be done. I don't know if there's something where it just kicks it off. Okay, I don't know. Sir. That's John who's in charge of that. But uh, I thank everyone for coming out. Uh, it was awesome. I believe at one point we had almost 120 people, so it was phenomenal. Carrie, you were awesome as always. Uh, there's one person who had a question for you. I believe it was Bastu, and he wanted to ask you about Bilderberg. Yeah, all right. Let's see if he has the question. Mac, you can ask your question while Bastu is typing. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me right now, sir? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, gentlemen, I just want to let you know I'm 50 years old, and uh, back in the 70s, we discussed a lot of these things that are happening today, believe it or not. And I wanted to let you know that this young group that you all are in is really is, is waking up to a lot of things that we've known for years. Um, I remember being 10 years old, 11 years old, something like that, and sitting in on a, on a John Birch meeting. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, it wakes you up. Uh, and, and we couldn't believe it at that point because we were talking socialism and communism and you name it. And uh, people weren't listening to it. There was a lot of talk about seceding from the Union when I lived in Alaska. And uh, there was a group called uh, Alaskans for Independence. And this was during the 70s and the 80s. And um, anyhow, a, a lot of people uh, are concerned about the, the government. They always have been. But this is just proving, without a doubt, that what my parents had warned me of is actually happening. And I uh, have no doubt, my friends, that uh, it's going to be a rude awakening. And, uh, and I've been told by people, well, geez, uh, it's never going to happen in, in the United States. And I said, well, wait until you get a Russian bayonet stuck up your ass, and then you come coughing to me. But I don't want to hear it. Now, I'm, I'm just warning people out here to be very respectful and adult when it comes to the Ron Paul Fest and spreading our word because we do not want to sound um, like, quote, conspiracy theorists, which I take offense to. These are conspiracy facts. But make sure that we pass out the correct information, triple check it, and encourage others to double check it themselves. Filter the BS. And that's all I wanted to say. Very true, Mac. Thanks for coming up. Thank you. It's awesome to hear from you know the old timers that have been aware of this for a while because that you know I think of everybody who sees hope in the movement. These folks are I mean they're really getting it more than anybody else because they've struggled so long to get this information out. Couldn't agree with you more, man. I mean it's they've lived it a lot longer than I have. I mean I'm only 23, but I feel like I'm pretty aware to a lot of my surroundings on what's going on. So, uh, yeah. Anyone else got any other questions? Oh, we got another one. I was going to say, did you get your builder hey, bird? That might be him right there. Hey, Bastu. How's it going, man? Hey, it's good. It's good. Hey, Matt. Hey, Carrie. 
Um, I wanted to ask Kerry if he thought that the Bilderberg meeting had any influence on the campaign uh, or the campaign managers either um, like immorally or just uh, monetarily or something. Because in my opinion, after Bilderberg, uh, Ron Paul stopped making public speeches and did not show up on as many shows such as um, uh, I, Maddo, the Rachel, uh, the Maddo show, for example. So, are you trying to say, like, basically, you think that something took place at the Bilderberg meeting, and Ron Paul's either threatened or he just kind of changed his plan and strategy at kind of an ironic moment, or what? Um. Not necessarily Ron Paul himself, but maybe his campaign managers and people around him. I've had some uh, worries, I guess, in the past about Ron Paul's campaign. I think that uh, Benton has released some ill-timed uh, letters out to the campaign and uh, I think that it demoralized people. Uh, I think the Rand Paul thing kind of demoralized people. But again, are we voting for Ron Paul's campaign staff and Rand Paul, or are we voting for Ron Paul and his message? Uh, people need to be able to see through the politics of politics, basically, because there is a huge game that goes on with politics. So. Uh, you need to just stay steady. Uh, don't worry about what Ron Paul is doing or not doing right now. Uh, he's come out with a couple other videos recently talking about the rally, uh, the RNC. Ron Paul is definitely still out there. He still wants to win, and we just need to trust Ron Paul because he wouldn't just throw away 34-plus years of politics for nothing. Ron Paul wouldn't do that to us. So. Ron Paul is the guy that I put my uh, trust in, I guess, basically. Uh, that's why people call us Paul bots, because they think that we trust Ron Paul and we put him up on a pedestal. We don't. We put his principle up on a pedestal, and we put his message up on a pedestal, because there are very few people in the world right now that are like Ron Paul. And to, to address the Bilderberg group, now you know, and this is this is what I do. All right, so so Jim Tucker is one of the guys that's been on the forefront of exposing this group for years. He's got moles on the inside, and he said they they essentially made it clear they wanted Paul eliminated. They, and and by eliminated, I mean you know JFK style kind of business. Do I think that had any bearing on the campaign? I would tell you that this is probably not Ron Paul's first fish fry. It's probably not the, the first time he's heard some threats. And, you know, I, looking at the campaign, you know, I had had some questions just, just like, you know, Matt here did about Jesse Benton and his, you know, his choice of timing. Uh, you know, when they hired Doug Weed, I kind of raised my eyebrows a little bit knowing who he's worked for in the past. But at the end of the day, you know, Bilderberg has a lot of a lot of say in the economy. They have a lot of say in policy. They they really do kind of get together to carve the world a little thinner up amongst themselves. But I don't think I don't think Dr. Paul is going to throw away his legacy of you know 30, 30 plus years of, of principle and integrity because some guy in a fancy suit got an attitude. Um, <clears throat> I trust Ron Paul. I do not trust Jesse Benton. And with that, I want to close with Go Ron Paul! Peace! It's pretty good, man. Pretty good. Well, I think we should close it up on here. Uh, oh, Ed's up. Go ahead, Ed. You want to close it, or do I get to ask a question? How you doing, Kerry? I'm doing well. How are you, Ed? Just great. Ed Vallejo from Phoenix. I have a question that I want to throw out there. I want to see what your answer is. With the 
call it birther movement, call it truther movement, call it what you will, with the with the controversy uh, surrounding Barack Obama's uh, status as a natural born citizen, which the founders believed was someone born on American soil of both parents who were born on American soil. With all that controversy, why is it we don't hear anything about the validity of some of the people that have have run here recently? I mean, out of out of uh, out of Ron Paul, Mitt Romney, Newt Gingrich, Rick Santorum, and Barack Obama, out of five people, only two of them were born on American soil, of Amer both parents born on American soil, and that's Ron Paul and Newt Gingrich. Because Mitt Romney's father was born in Mexico, uh, uh, Obama's father was a, a British subject, and uh, Santorum's father was born in Italy and naturalized to America. Thank you. And you know, it's it's funny. I, I don't pay a whole heck of a lot of attention to this this birther business simply because the bankers who funded this this business in the first place, they are not going to throw their guy under the bus. They're just not. And and to be able to do anything about it is going to be crazy. I, you you see him they, just recently they had the lawsuit about him being on the ballot and his own lawyer said, yeah, that birth certificate is fake. And then they just went on about their business. And it's kind of like, well, wait a minute, that's fraud. You know, if, if I did that, signing up for the Army, guess where they're going to throw me in a hole somewhere. But it, it, when it, I look at it like this. When you get into to the, the conspiracy-minded folks, they will focus on a specific topic with tunnel vision a lot of times. I run into this a lot. And in this case, I mean, it, it is all about Barack Obama. They're not going to talk about John McCain and, you know, being born, you know, I, I don't know where he was born at, but it, they, they made a lot of stink about it not being actually on American soil. But it ended up being like a military base, I think. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're right. A lot of these guys have parentage that are, you know, were born elsewhere, which makes them not, not natural born either. Good, good luck getting the mainstream media to do anything about that. You think Fox News is going to mention that, that Minton's Romney's daddy is a Mexican? I don't think so. I think it's one of those deals where they pick and choose what laws they want to enforce and what rules they want to enforce. Uh, when it's their golden boy, nothing's going to happen. Uh, but if Ron Paul had a parent that was born in Canada, Ron Paul would not even be able to be considered. And I guarantee you'd probably see all the other, like, presidential nominees, their records, their birth certificates, all that other history would be sealed. <laughs> it would be gone. You would not be able to find out any information unless you had a physical copy of it before. So that's my kind of theory on it. I think that rules are only for people who don't have friends in the higher-ups, for the normal folks like us. Those are who rules are for. Right. And laws and stuff. So, no, I honestly don't kind of raise, it doesn't raise any eyebrows when somebody tells me that Mitt Romney is illegal to run for the presidency or Rick Santorum because all it is is another person other than Ron Paul. So anyone but Paul is the GOP's motto. It's, it's stunning to me how frightened the GOP is of this man. I... I you know, I expect the attack dogs to come out from, you know, the liberal left of the, the false left-right paradigm. But, man, they did everything they could to destroy Ron Paul in the, in the GOP. Crazy. Well, guys and gals, I think that is a perfect note to leave it on. Uh, I thank everyone. For coming out here, having 96 people after T-Mod is gone, I'm very, very, very surprised that we had more than 30 people stay. So uh, I thank you. I look forward to doing this again next Wednesday, same time, same place, uh, hopefully with some more amazing guests. I don't know if I can top off having T-Mod and carry on in the same show, but I will do my best to try to get uh, a couple cool people on here. Maybe we'll get one or two. So. Uh, 
as always, guys, it's Matt Larson 10. Go Ron Paul. <laughs>